In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail to the divine heart of Jesus, that has wrought our salvation. To thee be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. The heart of Jesus Christ, the King, on his way to Golgotha, carrying the cross, our Lord fell certainly three times, some say much more. But in the Stations of the Cross, we venerate certainly the th three of the main falls of our Lord. Remember, our Lord had been completely raked from head to foot, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah. He will look like a leper from head to foot. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ, when He was formed in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Ghost, the Shroud of Turin, which is a treasure of our time that St. John Bosco and St. Francis de Sale had a great devotion to because they both lived in Turin, where the, the, this relic was kept for centuries. Uh, it's, it clearly shows our Lord was about six foot high. He was of perfect build, bone structure, mus muscular, because he was, he was always... Uh, cutting trees and working with with wood for 30 years and then the average man walked everywhere the average Jew made once or at least several times a trip to Jerusalem so they could easily our Lord was in three years of his public life just the public life it's estimated he walked up to 9,000 miles on foot so they weren't wet noodles, that's for sure. But our Lord, in His body, His nervous system was also the most perfect. So He was perfectly built. And He was made to built to suffer. Because His nerves were very fine. They were fine-tuned, like some guitars, some pianos. They're a little off. But, but our Lord Jesus Christ, being perfect God and man, His body was perfect to enable Him to accomplish the redemption. And He would not go in halves. He will go the full drinking of the most bitter chalice, the greatest suffering which surpasses the human mind. Physically, it already brings medical doctors to awe. Medical doctors who study the shroud, they just say his body was so traumatized, it was miraculous he could make it to Golgotha to be crucified after the, the, the most cruel scourging, which ripped him to shreds from head to foot on both sides, from head to foot. And the shroud shows our dear Lord was stripped naked and hung up in this position so that his body, his toes were barely touching the ground. So our Lord suffered the shame of being exposed to a crowd. The most innocent lamb, the most pure lamb, exposed to the crowd, and then raked with three sets of scourges. The first set was leather thongs, which already his skin was softened by the bleeding, the, the rivers of blood, that he sweat in the garden of, of uh, Gethsemane. It's called, the medical term is hematradosis, hematadrosis, where they sweat blood. But our Lord didn't just sweat a tiny little smear of blood, he sweat rivers of blood. And he was so crushed, and Gethsemane means the wine press, and it's not a mistake, because Christ, says St. Ambrose, Christ is the cluster of grape that was crushed in the wine press and that with his sacred heart crushed and his precious body crushed he pours out to us to drink the sweet wine of his most precious blood in the holy sacrifice of the mass and in holy communion this was the heart the love of our lord and this is what drove him to go through such suffering because he was thinking of your souls and mine and he's being he's God he can see all the way down the centuries all the souls by name 
who will love him in return, the very few compared to the mass of the human race, the comparatively few who will actually love our Lord and die for the love of him in the state of grace. <coughs> so for that, it was worth it to go through the passion. So our Lord, already he, the, the, the first round of scourges, his skin was already very tender. So when these leather belts of the Romans whipped him with strength, the Roman soldiers were not pansies. These guys were tough soldiers. And most of the time they just wanted to get back home, do their service, get back to Rome with their families, and on with their life. So they, they had no care. And according to Scripture, they, would, they were already drinking in the morning. So some of them were already pretty well soaked and then they would also have a game on like a hopscotch game that the kids play but there was an, an adult military game and they would kind of chalk out on the ground to get points and who can make the blood splash the farthest and so when they when they first the first round of scourging was the leather belt so our lord's whole all his skin would just have swelt with massive bulges of black and blue bulges so that by the second round of scourges these already had heavy knots and these knots would just burst open these swollen pockets of blood all over his body and our Lord he was pouring blood already with the second round and when the, the second round of soldiers were completely exhausted the third round came and these are the ones that had the teeth, these had the bones, these had metal pieces that are clearly, they're about metal squares, little tiny metal squares that, that dug deep into the flesh. When you got a whip coming at you at over 80 miles an hour, that, that just cut deep into the flesh and in some parts of the body, right to the bone. And the chunks of the teeth and the bone just tore off whole massive chunks of the flesh of our Lord. So that in this scourging it had to be quite a spectacle. It was something the Romans rarely saw because the law forbade going over 49 whips, whippings. But Pontius Pilate the liberal demo-rat demo that he was, the democratic, trying to please the people, he, and not respecting truth, he's a true liberal modern government president. Perfect. Pontius Pilate. He fits the picture perfect. Truth has no, no claim on anything. And he treats truth like trash. And so truth, Christ who is the truth himself, he is violently whipped so that his face is cut up, his whole chest is ripped up, his back, especially in the shroud, his back is just mangled, so that the, the prophecy of Psalm 21 is really fulfilled, which says, they have numbered all my bones, numbered all my bones. What does that mean? It means two interpretations according to some of the fathers. One, the dislocation of his bone, not breaking, but on the cross they dislocated his, it was his left shoulder, which is extremely painful. And then the second interpretation is they could count some of the ribs. His back and his sides were so torn up they could count four, five, six, seven ribs on him, on both sides. So this, the sound of the scourging had to be brutal. And Our Lady heard it all. The Blessed Virgin Mary, every single whip, every single wound, she suffered it. Blessed Mary of Agreda, it was revealed to her by the Mother of God that she suffered everything with our Lord. And she wouldn't want anything else. And she wanted with all her heart to die in the place of our Lord, but she knew that her blood could not redeem the human race. It had to be our Lord, the Lamb of God. And so this innocent lamb, as you Australians, at least maybe some of your ancestors here, Australians are known for being uh, the world's greatest sheep shearers. 
and the, the 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 prophecy and the words of Isaiah really applied to our Lord. He was like a lamb before the slaughterers. He opened not his mouth, and being being a man, perfect man. Many of the Roman soldiers were used to criminals cussing and swearing them as they were beaten and whipped. But our Lord, no cussing, no anger, meek and humble of heart, who drinks this chalice for the love of the Father and to save our souls from going to hell. So, after the scourging, they cut the ropes and our Lord just fell splashing in the massive puddle of his blood and normally with such a blood loss you're faint and they go unconscious it was an incredible amount of blood loss already by 10 o'clock in the morning 10 10 30 in the morning our Lord had already suffered the streams of blood in the agony of the garden the bloodletting during the tortures of the prison where the Jews <clears throat> just tortured him brutally and he bled down there as well and then at the scourging he had already lost a massive quantity of blood most men couldn't walk straight and yet you see the power of Christ the the true Samson because with not much blood in his veins and with not much no moisture in his mouth he carries the cross like a athlete like a real Samson. And Samson truly prefigured Christ. And, and Christ truly prefigured, fulfilled it. Not just the spiritual strength, but the physical strength to carry a cross over 130 pounds on the right shoulder. And he embraced that cross like an athlete gladly holds up his trophy for the crowds to see as they cheer him on after he won the wrestling match boxing match, hockey match, rugby match, whatever it be, they're proud of that trophy. And our Lord embraced this trophy of the cross. Because this is the trophy that's going to rescue and save millions of souls from hell. And it's a trophy of Christ's love. And when Christ comes to judge, right now He's, he's hidden in the Blessed Sacrament. And we don't see His majesty and glory. He hides Himself under the veils. The eternal God and King of heaven and earth, before whom the angels sing and fall before, chanting, Santus, Santus, Santus. And that one word created heaven and earth in six days of creation. And that same God is here. And on the day of judgment, <clears throat> all the angels are going to gather all the relics of the cross that are scattered throughout the world, splinters of the relics of the cross. And they're going to rebuild, says St. Thomas Aquinas, the actual cross. And Christ will carry it to the judgment of the whole human race. The cross of our redemption. And so our Lord, when he picked up the cross after being condemned to death, in a cowardly way by Pontius Pilate, our Lord embraces this trophy and he begins the long journey to Golgotha. It was normally not long. It was normally not that long, maybe a hundred yards from the Praetorium, outside the city walls, up to Golgotha. It wasn't too grand a, a length if you do the mapping. But it was extra long because the Jews blocked the streets. And they forced the, the procession to go long and through the streets so the Jews could unleash their satanic fury on our Lord and they threw cabbages, lettuce, tomatoes, rotten vegetables and fruits at him. They violently tried to kick him on his way. So that our Lord being just as it says in Psalm 21, fat bulls have surrounded me, bulls with horns that gorge their victim. And if you've ever seen a bullfight or not a bullfight probably in Australia, but certainly bull riding in America, rodeos are very popular, riding bulls. <clears throat> and uh, on one of the boys' camps, we took the boys to a rodeo in Montana. And uh, the rider was thrown off the bull, and the bull turned around and gorged him 
right in the rear side, picked him up by one horn, threw him on the ground, and they had to take him to the ambulance. So that's one bull, but the scripture says, many bulls have surrounded me. And our Lord was kicked and gouged so violently that when he fell the first time on the way of the cross, think about the fall. Let's go to a little detail here, because this is what he did for us. He's thinking of us. And when we, when we are washed in his blood by our baptism and when we go to confession, this is the price of our soul. All this such suffering, such suffering, so that if you had a friend who went through even a tiny bit of the passion just for the love of you, you'd love him forever in gratitude. But what about our God who has suffered unbelievable suffering that cannot even be comprehended? Heroically suffered for the love of each soul. And he told St. Teresa of Avila, I would go through all the passion just for your soul. And he would do that for each one, each soul. Oh, Father, you're being excessive. No, because God's love is infinite. His wisdom is infinite. But it's true, it's a fact that it was sufficient to redeem the human race. Even, even if our Lord just took a pin, stuck it in his finger, squeezed out one drop of blood, says St. Alphonsus, that would have been sufficient to redeem the human race. Totally sufficient. But it wouldn't convince most of us. We wouldn't be convinced of the love of God and how serious sin is and how serious God is to rescue us from the eternal fires and torments of hell. He is not messing around. His love is serious. And it's so serious that it brings Him to suffering and death, which He willingly embraced for our, for our redemption and to, for the glory of the Father. So, the first fall, our Lord has the cross. His knees give out because he's being kicked like, like by all these rats, <laughs> the rabble of the Jews. They're just attacking him like a bunch of mosquitoes in, in, a, in a plague. Our Lord falls. He hits the ground first. His head hits the ground. Remember, he's got the chains of the Garden of Gethsemane on his ankles. So he can't walk even normally. He trips over, he falls, the, the crown of thorns is on his head, which was a massive helmet of three parts, the shroud shows, three parts to the crown. And as our Lord hit the ground, the velocity of the cross comes weighing down, weighing twice as heavy because it's falling and sandwiches his head between the ground, the thorns, the thorns on the other side, and the cross just smashing his skull, driving the thorns deeper into the skull, into the temple area where normally a man is knocked out. In a good boxing match, sometimes wrestling, I know in ice hockey for sure, probably on rugby fields too, it's not un unusual that a guy gets knocked out. And these are tough guys, even with helmets, they get knocked out. So normally, in such a, a man, uh, uh, any normal man would be knocked out cold, finished. They couldn't even get up. They couldn't see straight. Their eyes would be cross-eyed. But our Lord falls. His head is smashed. And he revealed to Mother Mary of Agreda that one of the thorns pounded into, through the eyelid and over the eye. So his eyes were filled with blood. The head wounds bleed the most. Our Lord is just dripping hot blood pouring down his face, his shoulders, his beard. And don't forget those eyes of mercy that look upon us when we kneel before him in the tabernacle, when we kneel before him especially to confess our sins to him, because his eyes say everything, filled with blood and tears for our redemption, for our souls. Our Lord then gets up. Now that had to be tremendous to witness this. But he uses every bit of his strength and he's God. Yeah, he's God. But he's also human. He's united to the human nature. His heart is broken. Because these are the, the Jews who he loved and died for. 
who fed them in the desert, who, who saved them by the crossing of the Red Sea. He worked so many miracles for the Israelites, took care of them, and all they do is return him this. And then we are no different. All the graces God has given us, and we return this to him. And he gets up with his strength of a lion, because he is truly the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he picks up the cross. And the Roman soldiers by this time, they're probably Longinus. Remember, he converts and becomes a Catholic martyr. Longinus is, is head of this procession. And he's already seen, this is not a normal man here. And he looks at the other soldiers. We've never seen something like this. A guy so beaten, so pounded, so suffering such blood loss, and gets up. They've never seen this. So already Grace is already hitting Longinus. And he's going to see a lot more. This is just the beginning. And then our Lord carries on, carrying the cross, and made to go through the wandering wide streets and narrow streets of Jerusalem. And the Jews just unleash their fury. And they kick him again. And then, and then our Lord falls a second time, repeating the whole procedure, opening all the wounds, falling in the dust. And the Jews surround him, kicking him, his sides. And the Shroud of Turin shows an excessive amount of uric acid that flowed through all his pores and his blood. The uric acid is, is, is purified by our two kidneys. So what does that tell us? It tells us medically that our Lord was so violently kicked in his sides, his kidneys stopped working. They stopped functioning. So that means all the blood that in the uric acid, the ure, uric acid that we purified through the kidneys, is burning his skin. It's like a burning salt burning through the wounds. So all these medical details show us in more depth what physical suffering Christ suffered, but we'll never comprehend the sorrows of his most sacred heart, how he saw in advance and in the future my sins for which I must weep for which I ask you to that for my conversion that I weep for my sins and save my soul and he saw also all of your sins and all the sins of priests, bishops, popes with this horrible ecumenism and he saw it all he saw the sins of abortion the horrible crimes of euthanasia birth control and um, divorce, etc., etc., etc. He sees it all, all the smallest sins of lack of charity, all the smallest sins of thought, all the smallest sins of cruelty to our neighbor, whether it be actual cruelty or with our tongues, or even our thoughts. Accusing others of sins when we have no evidence, that's a sin of rash judgment. So all these sins, our Lord takes on Himself. He really is the 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 scapegoat who was driven out of the walls of Jerusalem as the scapegoat was and the priests would put their hands over him like this like the priest does at mass the hankichitur and all the sins are laid on the scapegoat, the lamb then our Lord finally is driven out through the walls of Jerusalem through the west walls up to Golgotha and then our Lord again the ascension to the mount, the weight of the cross, the surrounding of the crowds, he falls the third time. The third time. Why does he fall three times? Some mystics say our Lord fell many times. And it's after this third time, finally, they get Simon the Cyrenian to help our Lord carry the cross. Why does he fall three times? One, to give us hope that when we fall through our weakness, through our sins, through our crimes, through our mo most predominant fault, whatever it is, when we fall, we turn to the heart of Jesus, forgive us and get back up again. Get back up again. Get back up again. Don't be discouraged. Don't give in to despair. 
And that's always an attack of the devil. That is always the sign of the devil, is discouragement and despair. And he loves to drive souls to suicide, if he can get them. Because by suicide, if they do it with full knowledge and, and uh, knowingly, they go straight to hell. So, never be discouraged. Always trust in the love of our Lord. And that's why our Lord keeps getting up. And he also, what he told St. MacTield, who was the twin sister to St. Gertrude in the 1200s, a Benedictine sister, she saw our Lord's passion. He showed it to her. And she asked him, Lord, why did you take the crown of thorns that pierced into your skull? He says, my, my daughter and my bride, because I wanted to give you the most beautiful crown of flowers. And there's no flower more precious than thorns soaked in my blood of infinite price. That's the, that's the roses he gave to his bride. And to all those who love him, he crowns you. And then, Lord, she said, why did you fall so often on the way of the cross? And our Lord told her, you're my bride. You're my sister and my bride. And like David danced for, before the ark, I danced for the love of your soul. I fell and got up again. I fell and got up again. That was our Lord's so-called dance for his bride, St. MacTeald. And he was a, the, the dance is for his also his bride, the church, the Catholic Church, is his bride. And he danced out of love for us with a dance that was pure, out of pure the love of God, which was the dance of blood and suffering for our redemption. And then, and then uh, after the third fall, of course, our Lord struggles to get up. Again, normally, remember the whole head and the concussion bit. The soldiers are just, they can't understand. They're, they're, th they're already thinking, this, this man is not human. <laughs> He's not human. Normally, he, there's no man that could do this. And the Roman soldiers were used to this. And they were already in shock. And then to see him hang for three hours alive three hours with the earthquake the massive earthquake that struck the entire earth because the whole earth revolted at man's deicide the killing of our God and we were all there on Golgotha on that day by our sins but let us also be there by our repentance with some Saint Mary Magdalene and with the Blessed Virgin Mary asking her to help us love our Lord, who gave His life really, as He said it Himself, greater love than this no man has, than to lay down his life for his friend. And if you got a friend who will do that, that's pretty great. In the world wars and in many uh, stories of the battles, there's many accounts. We, we got, even in the United States, many accounts in uh, among uh, Michael Mansour, he's one of the heroes of the Navy SEALs and um, his, the, the soldiers were there one night polishing their rifles and whatever this was um, uh, it was in Afghanistan 1996 and a hand grenade came right in the middle of them all Michael Mansour, who was a traditional Catholic, he wore a scapular, he went to the Tridentine Mass, he was a Navy SEAL. He, no one was doing anything, they just all froze. And he did the classic heroic thing, jumped on it, and he got blue blown up, but he saved his brothers. So Michael Mansour is, is a true hero. So all these fellow soldiers would certainly love him, because they saved his life. But our Lord, he says, Greater love than this no man has than to lay down his life for his friends, which is easy to do for your friend. But what did our Lord do? He went way farther than that. He laid down his life for his enemies. Because all of us were born in the wrath of God. We were born in original sin. We were already born enemies of God. And our Lord died for his enemies which all of us were. 
And we only become friends of our Lord when we're washed in His precious blood in our baptism. And when we fall into sin, wash in His precious blood in the sacrament of confession. So see the value of your soul. And if you don't believe our Lord's suffering for you, and if you don't believe all that He did for you and myself, then learn from the enemy. Learn from the devil the value and the price of your soul. How hard he works to damn each one of us. How hard he works. No businessman works harder than the devils, especially Lucifer. They work day and night, 24-7, century after century. They do not give up. And that shows us, your, the devil knows the power, the value, the preciousness of your soul. So see the value, the value of our soul. Let's try always to live in the state of grace and really convert this Lent <clears throat> to our Lord, to really beg Him through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, help us to love our Lord really. And how do we prove it? By suffering, by carrying the daily cross, fulfilling our duties of state, keeping the Holy Roman Catholic faith in the face of all odds. The whole world has gone against Christ. And it's, we're coming, it's logical. As one communist told a young man who was a Roman Catholic and refused to participate in the, the youth events of the communists and to drink their brainwash. This was in, the, in Slovakia. And uh, the communist chief, whatever his name was and whatever rank he was, he said, the likes of you, Roman Catholics, will not fit into the new world order. You're not going to fit. And he is right. We won't fit into this anti-Catholic age. We don't fit. And that means the blood and persecution. That means bloodshed and persecution. That means mockery. That means marginalization, as it happened many times. Look at Ireland. The Catholics could not enter politics. They couldn't hold a decent job. For over 150 years, the penal laws, the persecution under the Protestants. And those who died heroically through all that are martyrs. So we got to realize, to follow our Lord, we got to really follow Him to death. <coughs> And happy you and I, if by the grace of God we persevere. We've got to carry the cross, and our Lord will sweeten it by help of His grace and of His Blessed Mother. But never get exhausted, never get weary, never get tired. And if you do, say what our Lord said, Lord, let this chalice pass from me. But not my will, but thine be done. And He will give you the grace. And in these days, we've got to, we got to carry the cross and be faithful and never compromise the Holy Catholic faith. Neither go to the right by Sedevicantism, nor to the left by liberal compromise with the New Mass, or the Motoproprio Latin Mass, or the new SSPX, or the fake resistance, which are trying to bend backward to justify Vatican II and the New Mass. It cannot be rescued. Vatican II belongs in hell from where it came. The New Mass belongs in hell from where it came. And the, the, one of the worst sins of our time are these bishops who are using the Latin Mass as a tool to get traditional Catholics back into the conciliar church. And we must not fall for that. A priest who, who accepts Vatican II and the New Mass, even if he says the Latin Mass, don't go. It is dangerous to the faith. So, dear, dear faithful here in Australia, you had a great hero, one of the great heroes who kept the faith and met Archbishop Lefebvre and called Archbishop Lefebvre to come to Australia. And I never met him myself, but I've heard a lot about him. And that's the great Father Cummings. Some of you might have known him. But... Uh, out in Streaky Bay, those, those men out there remember him with great love, and they knew him. And he would travel all over Australia, even into New Zealand and other islands in Singapore to bring the Mass. He was kicked out by his superior, 
And he was truly a hero of the faith. And at one point, uh, one Navasoto priest mocked Father Cummings and said, Oh, that old bag of bones, because he was very thin, he was a redemptorist and not too healthy looking. Uh, he had a bag of bones. Why are you following him anyway? He's going to be dead before long. All you're going to have is the new Mass, so you better conform now. And guess what happened? That priest who mocked him died in a few years, and Father Cummings outlived him by 30-something years. So, <laughs> beware of mocking <laughs> the, the true Mass and the priests who say it. So, Father Cummings is a great hero of your country. And uh, we've had over a hundred of the, these like in the United States who, who kept the faith, kicked out by their bishops. So, blessed be God, these are our days when you're going to be mocked, ridiculed, marginalized, and maybe put to death for the, for the love of our Lord. And what is that? To give my life for our Lord. That's nothing. The saints said, I wish I could give a thousand of my lives for our Lord. If I had a thousand lives, I'd give them all for Him. So what's the big deal of giving just one of our, our one life for Him, when He gave His for us? So for such a love of God, says St. Augustine, let's give Him the return of all our love, all our intelligence, all our strength, all our capacity, all our energies to love and glorify this God who loves us so much that today, right now, we're not just Protestants here commemorating the memory of Christ. No, He's here in the tabernacle. The sacred heart of Jesus burning on the cross in His resurrected body is right here in the tabernacle. And then He's going to reenact in the priest's hands the sacrifice of Golgotha on the cross in an unbloody mystical manner but the real same sacrifice right here on the cross and then the priest is going to pluck that fruit of this tree of life and give you to eat of this new tree of life the fruit of the womb of the Virgin Mary in the Holy Eucharist and you're going to eat this delicious fruit which used to give in the Garden of Eden Adam and Eve gave, gave them immortality and strength and perfect health and youth. And this is what the Holy Eucharist does. Much more for your soul. Gives you the youngness of your soul. Youth by grace. And increase of grace. And it could even burn off all your purgatory if we relieve, receive Him with perfect love and charity which He must give us. So this is the power of the Holy Eucharist and the love, burning love of the Sacred Heart. So ask Him, Lord, inflame my heart Give me the heart of your mother to love you with. And give me, O Mary, the heart, your heart, to love our Lord with. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.